So thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk to this to you at the summit. Um, the concept of value-based healthcare to me is really in our in my DNA. So when I kind of think about defining it or picking apart what we do as part of value-based healthcare, it's a bit tricky for me because community health centers are built by communities, they're governed by communities, and they're run by communities. So to me, it's just part of everything we do. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about community health centers in Ontario and talking about two different projects that I think really exemplify value-based healthcare, team care, and something called social prescribing. And then I'm going to be talking about how we measure things in community health centers to really um, try to ensure we've got that value-based healthcare uh, momentum going through everything we do. So first off, I wanted to talk a little bit about primary care in Ontario, just because uh, I wasn't sure if people understood the primary care landscape. And it's a bit of an alphabet soup in Ontario. So we've got the figs, the fins, the fits, the foes, the, the CHCs, the AHACs. And I mean, I don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all those acronyms. But you can imagine it's a bit of an alphabet soup. So really, all of those different alphabets mean is how physicians are paid. So that's really what they, what they all mean. Um, but there are some other differences that are kind of important to talk about. So within two models, specifically that I'm going to be talking about, CHCs and family health teams, they have access to interprofessional um, interprofessional teams. So community health centers um, have family physicians and nurse practitioners, but they also have nurse practitioners and dietitians and social workers and health promoters, and they work along a whole continuum of care providers to serve the clients they the clients they have at their at their organizations. Now, only 30% uh, of Ontarians, though, have access to these interprofessional teams. So it's a huge equity issue within, within, our, within, our, on, within Ontario. So the, where community health centers came from um, in Ontario were really part of a wave of healthcare reform that started in the 70s. So we were sort of the first healthcare experiment in the 70s, and we stuck. So there's over 100 community health centers in Ontario now. Uh, we, we consider community-governed family health teams as, as part of our, sort of our umbrella. But we're not a new concept. So community health centers have been around in Canada since the 1920s with the first community health center um, opening up in Manitoba. Uh, there's a few foundational differences, like I said. Uh, the, the biggest one, I think, is that community health centers are built by the communities they serve. So if there's an area in Ontario and the community rallies up, they used to be able to get a community health center. So they would uh, you know, build a community health center, and they're governed and run by the communities they serve. So if you're a client at a CHC or you live in the community of a CHC, you can actually be on the board of directors planning and, and managing the care that's provided at that CHC. So why that's really important, as you can imagine, is this actually helps dictate the types of people they serve the types of services they provide, how they measure the care, and how they plan for the future. There's some other key differences between CHCs and other primary care models that I think deserve uh, some attention. We've talked about this uh, as throughout the day. I think there's real, we have a relentless focus on health equity and, um, and inclusion. The CHC motto is that everyone matters, and that's like foundational through community health centers. And I'm going to talk about how we do that with measurement as well. Um, Jennifer Clawson talked about the importance of uh, a non-fee-for-service model. Every provider within our organizations are paid a salary. So if you're a physician, if you're a nurse practitioner, if you're a psychologist, everyone's paid a salary. And you have an executive director that helps provide the strategic direction for where you're going that's, again, governed by the communities we serve. We have interprofessional teams that include health promotion and community development. So when we talked about the upstream downstream kind of concept that we talked yesterday or just a few minutes ago, you know, that's very important. You know, if you're a physician, you might be seeing that kid with diabetes or obesity, but then there's also community development workers trying to improve parks so there's a safe place to play. So, you know, we work along that full continuum and it's never one against the other, it's always both. Um, it's integrated care and partnership building, and all of this is done within an evaluation framework that measures um, different aspects of care in a multiple, in a variety of ways that I'll talk about. 
So this is just uh, what we call a, our model of health and well-being, and it's really just our roadmap for how community health centers operate, which is the the color, the one with the, the more colors, and then there's the holistic model of health and well-being, which is the Aboriginal health um, model of health and well-being, which we um, the alliance works in allyship with. So we these are both sort of our roadmaps on how we provide service. One of the, um, so even though we've all got the same roadmap, everyone follows the same values, we've got the same sort of service delivery, we offer care in the same way, every CHC is different because of the communities they serve. So unless you've got the exact same community, you'll see CHCs being vastly different. But underlying, they've all got the same values and foundational pieces. There was one executive director that once said, if you've seen one CHC, you've seen one CHC. So despite having this common roadmap, foundational were the same, every CHC looks different because of the communities they serve. So as you've probably picked up, community health centers are more than just places that treat people who are sick. Our model really attempts to improve health and well-being for the people they serve. We know from evidence you've heard already today that up to 70% of health status is determined from factors beyond health care. And stuff like poverty and isolation and education and language barriers, ethnicity are all associated with a variety of um, health risks. Some evidence is suggesting that loneliness has the same impact on mortality as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. And it's, and it's really becoming known as a, a strong health risk. The UK recently appointed a national minister for loneliness, and just on the weekend there was an article in the, New in the New York Times that stated we should wage a war on loneliness. So it's a really it's becoming a, a lot more picked up in our, in our language. We also know that you know throughout our life and the way we're living our life now that loneliness and social isolation is increasing. This isn't news to CHCs. We have um, had interprofessional teams working with isolated people, isolated communities since our conception. We've got uh, social workers and dietitians and community kitchens and seniors drop-ins and homework clubs that bring people together to really help uh, bridge communities. Um, but as you might have realized, only 30% of Ontarians have access to teams and even less have access to community health centres, about 5%. And this is where we decided team care is a solution. And uh, because most people, I don't know about people in this room, most people only have access to a primary care physician, not a social worker or a dietitian or a health promoter. So this is where we decided we came up with team care. So team care, as I said, I think is part of the solution. The services at CHCs are open to anyone in the community. If you're resourceful enough, you go into that community health center and you say, I want to be part of the Tai Chi classes, I want to be part of the community kitchen, and I want to see the dietitian, our services are open to you. But you need to be resourceful, you need to even know that you can do that. Team care, on the other hand, is a very deliberate project where community health centers are working with all of those primary care providers without access to teams and saying, we'll be your team. So if you're a primary care provider, if you're a physician without a team, we're trying to build a collaborative model so you can refer and work in collaboration with, with community health centers. So the way it works is each participating community health center is working with uh, those non-team physicians the patients and the interprofessional teams to design these team care projects. We want to make sure that all of the necessary services are available. So if you are a primary care provider in your in your neighborhood in the CHC neighborhood that needs physio, we want to make sure that there's accessible physiotherapy for your patients. Now I should I should uh, just mention that this all of the community health services community health centers really serve people with barriers to care. So we sort of talked about that this morning. Um, you know, I think somebody mentioned about a person not having resources for mental health care or mental health care supports because they don't have extended health care. That's what team care is for. If you have extended health insurance, that, that, this may not be appropriate. That's not to say you still wouldn't benefit from the Tai Chi in the community kitchens. It's just you may be able to access social care, uh, mental health services somewhere else. So once a person is referred to the CHC, they may see the dietitian or the social worker, the primary reason that physician referred them, but they also have a full 
intake assessment. So this is looking at all the person's needs. So if a person also wants to join the community kitchen, if they want to take yoga class, if they want to do mindfulness classes, whatever they want to do, those services are available for the person. There's also that big community calendar that shows all the events going on and people are attending to stick around. So what we thought might be four to six visits for those uh, patients from other primary care physicians, they're actually ending up just staying at the CHC. The person still very much keeps that primary care physician as their primary care provider. We just become their extended team. So this is just a, a visual of how the team care project works. As I said, the physician-patient relationship still is foundational. But now that physician and their patient have access to a full range of team supports. You know, we sort of refer to it as virtual uh, team, but it's sort of a weird word. So I think it's you know just a collaborative team environment. We're hoping that the physicians and the teams both feel comfortable enough to pick up that phone and say, you know, I've got a I've got somebody in my office right now that I need you to help, and that that relationship truly is collaborative. That it's beyond just a referral. We've got some team care sites that have actually put system navigators in emergency rooms. And that's been really helpful because sometimes people are going to emergency rooms for things that aren't necessarily relevant or necessary to be seen there. So they're hooking people up with the system navigator to help them with supports at the community health center. So our goal with this team care project is really to try to build a strong primary care foundation. There's a lot of literature that suggests that this strong primary care foundation is really important for uh, health care improvements. And uh, you know, we, we're trying to fix hallway health care. A strong primary care foundation will, will help do that. The preliminary results are pretty, pretty strong. So as Leah said, I'm a researcher by trade, so this is kind of my bread and butter. We started this in 2018, and just, you know, this is kind of like the little team care project that could. We've increased access to um, over 22,000 people through this team-based care. They've, that 22,000 people have made over 105 visits, 105,000 visits, and we're working in collaboration with over 1,600 primary care physicians. So you can see that that's, it's really growing. And if you look at sort of the graph, we were, we were sort of slow to start, and then this year, only in Q, like we've only finished half the year, we've shot up like that. So you know, I'm really expecting it to continue growing. People are saying that they can't imagine life without team care. They're relying on their social workers and dietitians and all of those supports so much. And physicians are saying they can't imagine their practice without team care. There was one funny story of a physician saying, you know, I saw my patient, they came in, and I was used to seeing them for a bunch of different issues. And I said, how's your relationship? Oh, yeah, I'm dealing with that with my social worker. OK, let's talk about your diet. Oh, no, no, I don't need to talk about my diet. All I need you to do is look at my blood pressure. And so she was like, Okay, this is this is perfect. This is my area of expertise. So she felt that everything was being cared for. So I'm going to switch uh, slightly and talk about another project that's very much aligned to team care, and you'll see a lot of similarities. But this time we're focusing both internal to the CHCs and within sort of external organizations through team care, and this is called social prescribing. Social prescribing is a deliberate pathway that connects a biomedical model to the social elements. Even in CHCs, we've got all of these aspects of care. Social supportive care is sometimes ad hoc and is often not measured well. So that's where we're really trying to improve this. And this project is trying to strengthen the connection between primary care and health promotion, just to continue to always make that link. link. It goes beyond health promotion, though, and includes an assessment of what people need and want and builds on community strengths and partnerships. And this is where it gets really cool. So the way they do it is when a physician or nurse practitioner is seeing a patient with complex needs, they make a social referral. This could be to a social worker, it could be to a support group, or it could be to somebody we call a community champion who has a certain set of skills, interests, and abilities that might be championing a, a, a group on their own. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, a bit more. Because that's sort of the key, that's what the, when the beauty, ha beauty happens with social prescribing, because you're building on the capacities and the skills and the interests of the community members themselves to start providing uh, support for their fellow community members. So I'm going to dive into a few of the essential components. The first key component is similar to team care, is that that primary care provider is foundational. 
When a socially vulnerable or marginalized person is experiencing poor health, the relationship with the primary care provider or their physician or nurse practitioner is foundational. It's perhaps the only trusted relationship they have. And the, the advice of that doctor or nurse practitioner carries great weight and authority. So when that doctor or nurse practitioner makes a social referral, and they say, you know, maybe you want to try something different, often that's heard with, with re renewed interest. So social prescribing emphasizes the integration between clinical and community supports. Recognizing that physicians and nurse practitioners are an essential role, but they also have an essential role to provide that non-medical care as well through these supports. And it ensures that the client data kind of follows a whole journey across the continuum of care. So when we've asked physicians and nurse practitioners about the nature of their visits, they say that 25 to 50% of their visits are for non-medical things. And that makes sense. If they're the only trusted provider you've got, and you've got some concerns that are causing you stress or causing you to feel anxious, you would go to your primary care provider and talk to them about it. So what they're saying is with through uh, social prescribing and team care, this provides them another avenue to provide supports for the clients they serve. And it helps them connect with non-primary care resources. So we're currently piloting social prescribing in a really uh, concrete way in 11 different CHCs in Ontario. So this is really that deliberate pathway I talked about. So this is happening in all community health centers, but this is the deliberate pathway. A key outcome in social prescribing, and this is where I was talking about the beauty of social prescribing, is that clients referred to social prescribing often become health champions themselves. And they begin to support other people in their community. So these health champions, in turn, increase the number of supports available in their community. So they may uh, have a great appreciation of art. They might be an artist, they might be a dancer, they might know yoga, they might uh, like fishing. And what happens is, through the health champions, they're connecting these people together. And they're being able to use their skills and share their skills just to provide supports for other people. So there's all sorts of amazing examples. So the, you know, in one small community, there was a person that had just moved in, an isolated uh, senior, and he wanted to go fishing. Well, the physician linked him up with a health champion who was also a fisherman. The fisherman lent him the tools, the fishing rod, and they went fishing. And now they've got a group of people who are fishing together. I mean, it's just providing an outlet and to have more social uh, connection. The pilots have also invited diverse communities who have different physical and mental health conditions from various cultural uh, backgrounds. They have different experiences. They're, um, all of these folks have different gifts and passions. One, uh, one kind of neat example is there was a group of people uh, who started a bereavement support group, and it actually resulted in a marriage. So <laughs> that's maybe one of our more unique outcomes, but you know, it resulted in a marriage. So you, know, you can imagine uh, that these clients who are now becoming health champions themselves have an increased sense of confidence. They've got a renewed sense of purpose. They've got a renewed finding in their, uh, in their community. They're, they know their neighbors. They know their community members now. And they belong. They feel like they belong in that health center as a health champion. So they've essentially been prescribed to be the prescription for others. I'm going to talk just finally about some of the measurement work we do in CHCs because I think that really also speaks to how we um, you know, recognize value. Um, health equity, like we've talked about, is continually measured. And this is really done to ensure that no one is excluded from the services we provide. So we purposely stratify all sorts of measurements by things like age, sexuality, gender, race, income, to ensure that people who might be kind of considered hard to reach or hard to manage, hard to treat, are offered equitable health care. So for example, we, um, I've, I've got, uh, so I just did some work last week on cancer screening. I stratified all of the data by poverty, like, uh, income and by race and by homelessness because we want to ensure that people living in poverty or people who wouldn't normally be screened due to their ethnicity or people who are homeless are still getting cancer screening the same as everyone else is. And you know, sure enough, I think by doing this, we've been doing this for years, you target interventions that are relevant for those folks. So if, um, you know, for people who are homeless, they may be coming in for something, 
a, a wound infection or something else. And the, the, in the CHCs, they call it max packing. And so they'll say, you know, while you're here, let's do this. And because they know exactly who hasn't been screened. And so despite being kind of hard to reach populations, the cancer screening in CHCs is higher than anyone else in Ontario because we measure it and we make sure that even people who normally aren't screened are. We measure all sorts of process measures and all sorts of financial accountability measures. I mean, that's kind of what we do, not terribly interesting, but we do it a lot, and we set targets. So everything we do is that we set targets. All of the data we have is shared across organizations. So it was talked about this morning, you know, how do people do that? We just, we do it. Uh, we have a, a fairly robust uh, leadership uh, group that have committed to sharing data across organizations. So. You know, there's no shame, there's peer groups. So we don't, you know, if someone has a lower score on a certain measure compared to somebody else, they, I don't think they feel shame. They call the person who's their peer and said, how, how do you do it? So if you have a large population of people who are homeless and your no-show rates are higher than somebody else, you then call the person that's figured it out and, you know, you know how do you do open access better? So we just figure it out. We're starting down the patient reported outcome measures. I, every CHC have, have measured patient reported outcomes in some way. We're doing this systematically as a, prov a provincial organization now. We're measuring patient reported outcomes. It's fairly new and it was a bit tricky because a lot of patient reported outcome measures are for, for a specific disease or a specific intervention. Now with primary care though, you're looking at the whole person, and you you know mul often people have multiple um, conditions, and you're you're with a person for their their whole life potentially. So how do you measure patient reported outcomes? So we found a tool, and we're we're testing it out across Ontario with, um, using this PROMS tool. Now, what's important with the PROMS tools, we'll also stratify that data. So we want to make sure that the patient reported outcome measures are similar across different vari uh, variations in income, or that certain, uh, if you're a newcomer, you have just as high patient reported outcomes compared to somebody else. So we're sort of, we're, we're measuring that. Patient involvement in care, I mean, that's something that's key for us. So we specifically measure whether a person's involved in care. Now, We've, we've tailored it a little bit because we know that not everybody wants to be as involved in care as other people do. So we, 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 have, we kind of have worked on that one. And finally, qualitative data. Um, an ongoing mantra for me as being kind of a measurement person is that there should be no data without stories and no stories without data. Because I think it then you just get the full picture. So everything we do, we try to have both qualitative and quantitative data to really uh, you know, tell the whole story. And uh, yeah, so th th I think that's it. And I, we've got some time for questions. And um, I'll be on the panel with other people, but uh, we've got a bit of time for questions. Thanks, Jen. Thanks. Uh -huh. Over to Mr. Morris. I'd be interested to know how many people here belong as a patient to a community health center? One. When, um, it took me four months to get into mine because okay. uh, my, my GP retired and uh, at the East End. Uh, Great, yeah, uh, East End. Unbelievable. I had to go through an interview, a slide presentation, and after that, they said, just go down the hall and I go in and see this pharmacist. The pharmacist goes over all my medications through, long little counseling session. Then he says, oh, now you just go down the hall to the next door and there's a nurse practitioner. And then she goes through a whole ordeal thing. Now, this is interesting. She says, oh, now you just go down the hall there for a little further and there's a nutritionist. Nutritionist goes over and now, how do you eat? What do you eat? When do you eat? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, go, going through all of that. And then I went down to the, the it was the nurse practitioner said, here, I booked you to see the GP next Monday. So I go in and see the GP on the Monday. He says, get your chair over here. Bring it over here. And he's got a big screen, computer screen, goes through my bone density test. He's showing me it on, on the screen. All the, all the medications going through everything. Absolutely incredible. The service is fabulous. And then they go through all the programs that are available, nutrition classes, yeah. cooking classes, running classes, exercise groups, and so on, and group uh, discussion yeah. uh, things. And I thought, where the hell did this place come from? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's over a hundred of them. <laughs> you know, and this is the way it should be done. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was, it's yeah. just been fabulous. And they phone you at home to make sure, did you fill your prescription? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There was a, an interesting project that was done um, in Smiths Falls, and two family physicians retired, and it was a bit of a town crisis, and they said, how on earth are we going to take, there were, the, there were older physicians who had been like heavy prescribers, and the people were super complex, and the CHC said, okay, well, we can take on the 500 of the most complex people but they're gonna have to go through some hoops. They're gonna to have to see a pharmacist, they're gonna to have to see a nurse practitioner, they're gonna to have to attend some group medical visits because by the time they see that physician, we want them to be totally organized <laughs> and, and, and all, you know, their chart needs to be all set up, everything needs to be set up and they need to understand the CHC model that we work as a team. So, yeah. All right, moving over here. Margaret, you're, I really like the idea, but we've also got, okay, coming from Saskatchewan, yeah. it's a lot more spread out. So you, you've really developed these, yeah. you know, easy. groups, but when you're in isolation, and by that I'm meaning remote, rural, you aren't going to get those groups which force them then into the bigger centers where they lose their support system, their friends. Um, my mother, who is now example 92, uh, lived on a farm. Dad moved her into town because he was ill and he didn't want her to be alone at that time. He passed away. The house is too big. Mm -hmm. She can't do things. Now we have to move her into the city, but she will lose everything. She will become lonely. And when I've watched others do this, there is a dementia that formulates in. We have to figure out a way to keep them where they are and not move them into the bigger centers. Mm -hmm. So somewhere we have lost something. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. And I think that's a key element in trying to think about aging in place and aging at home and, and just building supports. I think where we've really seen social prescribing work well is in less urban areas. I think sometimes in big urban areas, like in Toronto, for example, it's actually a little bit trickier for social, like where the magic has really happened in, is in rural, smaller communities in rural areas. I mean, social prescribing in Toronto has been, has been neat. They've given tickets to the art gallery and the museums, and there's been um, different clubs going on. But I think some of the really um, impressive stuff has happened in rural areas. This ha Might be, probably, yeah. I mean, yeah, probably. I mean, I, I'd need to understand your area better. But we do have this operational in the, in the, in the far north in Ontario, which are pretty, is pretty remote. But I think the, the center is com sometimes that community health center. So people are, com a community health center is often more than just a place where you get your health care. It's, it's our, you know, people have a sense of belonging, so they may just go and hang out. They go for coffee clubs, so it is it is different. Um, but I think in the UK, social prescribing is being done throughout the whole, across all of England, and they've developed these community champions in whatever area there are. So it doesn't need to be attached to a physician per se, but recognizing that every community member has strengths. So in, in your in your mom's community, there's probably a whole bunch of people that if if we could get people you know build community again and have more supports going on in that community. And just before we go to our next question or comment, I just want to supplement a little bit um, because part of the reason why I was director of policy is because I think it's such a great model and I want to see this spread not only across <laughs> Ontario but across Canada um, more broadly. But 
And in Ontario, where there are uh, more rural and remote community health centers, um, geography is often the biggest mm -hmm. yeah. uh, barrier. Yeah. And so they are serving everybody. You know, there might be some unique and specific populations within that, obviously, um, aging, et cetera. But, um, but really, it is that geographic spread that they're dealing with. And they often have many smaller sites across multiple smaller communities um, in order to be able to enable access. And they're having to innovate things like telehealth and et cetera. But to your point, you know, this is a model that already exists across the country, but there really just isn't, you know, what, two people in this room <laughs> are part of CHCs? Mm -hmm. There really just aren't enough of them, and certainly not in rural and remote. And certainly in Ontario, when it comes to flying communities, like that's a whole other ball game that yeah. hasn't yeah. been well addressed. I'm passing the mic to Jerry and then to Louise. Thanks, Leah. Um, just wanted to know if there was any um, interaction or um, way to bring CHCs into the new Ontario Health Team framework. Yeah, um, yeah it just help me sort of understand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with the early adopter, there was 31 Ontario Health Teams that kind of got put forward into the early adopter proposals. and. About 75% of them had CHCs playing a major role. I think CHCs are well positioned um, because they've got executive leaders and they're part of. They could, they've got time to have these conversations. They're situating themselves quite well, and I think um, you know team care specifically is being used as a leverage. Like Louise said, it's the carrot that's trying to bring all the primary care folks to the Ontario Health Team table. So if you're a solo doc or if you're a uh, part of a in a model without access to teams, when you're trying to build an integrated model, team-based care is important. And so CHCs are often using that. So I think CHCs are going to be well positioned with the Ontario Health Teams because we've CHCs work in that way anyway. Like they're population focused. They they work in integrated manners now. They're kind of like mini OHTs now. So I think more and more people are recognizing that. Um, thanks very much. I. I, I know you already know I'm a huge fan. Um, I'm wondering what role we can play if, if we really believe in CHCs and if we know that there aren't enough of them. Um, is there a role that we can play to, to work in partnership with you or, or other partners, whoever you suggest, to um, make this more of something that happens here in Ontario, but also for people in Saskatchewan and whatever yeah. the right you know, mechanism processes for their environment and other environments across the country. Is is there a role for us here? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think the more people ask for community health centers, the the better. I mean, I think before the last um, wave of primary care reform, CHCs were built by community members, and they they were you know communities would come together, and this is across Canada. It's not just in Ontario. Across Canada, people build community health centers. And I and you know I work with Catch, the Canadian Association of Community Health Centers, as well. So there are community health centers, and there's a whole movement going on in BC right now of increasing the number of CHCs because more and more people are demanding them. So I think absolutely there there is uh, room for that. So, and I think the other piece is I I think you know CHCs are uh, um, what Leah was saying you know CHCs are great at um, opening up satellites where they need to be. So, um, you know, even if there's not a new organization that's built, a new CHC, mm -hmm. we often have community health centers in multiple um, neighborhoods or multiple towns. So if there's, a, if there's a really small, small community, they may have six or seven CHCs in multiple small communities that are all sort of run by that larger organization, but they're in multiple towns. Thank you so much for that. So I love the idea that you collect data and you use it to improve downstream interventions. And I'm wondering how frequently you've used that same data to create policy briefs for politicians. Hmm. So kind of taking that collective data for a neighborhood and saying, well, this is what's happening in your neighborhood and what can be done at a social political level. I'd say all the time, all the time. Like whenever we, we run data at the individual, like for the downstream clinicians like to use to improve care, we're running the same data Data to inform policy, to inform planning, and to help change change policies to improve care. Fantastic, thank you. Always room for partnerships. <laughs> and no, I would say absolutely to that earlier question of Louise, 
Um, the Alliance for Healthier Communities is a provincial association. There is a national association, the Canadian Association of Community Health Centers. There's an international sort of uh, coalition anyways as well. So, um, and then as, as mentioned, you know, it is community groups in individual neighborhoods that, you know, really organizing um, to advocate for a new center or an expansion of an existing center into their community. All of these things uh, I think are really helpful to try to spread and scale. In the last couple slides on that note of data, you mentioned a prom tool that you're yeah. using. Are you able to elaborate on what tool that is and how, if it does, integrate with also acute care settings because GPs are only part of the picture? Yeah, I'd say that's so it's looking at primary care. But it's looking, so it, it doesn't look at the integration of care all that well. So as we move to Ontario health teams, you know, it's something that's very much in my mind. But um, it's, so it was developed by a team out of Bristol University in the UK, and it has been specifically tested um, for primary care measure. It was built for primary care and been tested with uh, community members and, and patients, and they, it really resonates. So I've got, um, it, it um, looks at uh, health and well-being, quality of life, health knowledge and understanding, confidence in health plans, and confidence in health provision. There's only 24 questions, so it's pretty easy, and I'm happy to share it with you. You need to have permission to use it, but um, it's it's widely available, and you you know you just need to ask permission to use it, and it's free to use. Uh, yeah, so we're we're doing it. We're, this is where we're sort of testing it right now. So we're using we're using a paper method, which is a really nice, simple tool. Um, but then we're also um, doing it on a tablet. So we've um, got we have an interface with our electronic medical record that it's called Ocean, and we just have it on a, a tablet, so people can fill out their prom tool, which is great because then we've got all of their you know their name and their clinical data as well. But so we, we're trying out both. Any last questions or comments? Thank you so much, Thanks. Jen. And